Um, so real quickly about number 57, we again have a recursively defined sequence um, and then a purported proof that, uh, that we know what the limit of the sequence is. This is the kind of argument that happens a lot in a calculus class, right? Uh, if I want to find what the limit of this recursive sequence is, I can just say, well, whatever the limit is, when I take the limit on both sides here, the limit is going to satisfy L is equal to 2 over L squared. And we can rearrange that equation to find that the limit must be the cube root of 2. So what's the flaw in this argument? And did anyone spot it? Yeah, so there's the issue, right? In order to make this algebra down here all accessible, what this person has to do is they have to take the limit on both sides of this equation, right? That's how we pass from the SNs to the Ls. Okay? The problem is that we can't take the limit on both sides of this equation and do any meaningful algebra with it to apply the limit properties. We can't do all those things unless we already know that this sequence converges. Right? If this sequence doesn't converge, then we can do all the algebra we want to and it'll be meaningless. You may have seen some examples like that in calculus, too. Um, so this is a little bit outside the scope of the problem, but how could we know whether or not this sequence is convergent? Let's look at the first few terms. If S1 is 1, then S2 is 2 over 1 squared. So that's 2. S3 is 2 over 2 squared. That's 1 half. S4 is 2 over 1 half squared. Let's see, 1 half squared is 1 fourth. 2 over 1 fourth is 8. S5 is going to be 2 over 8 squared. That's 1 over 32. S6 is going to be 2 over 1 32nd squared. Is 2 over 1,024. Uh, 2 over 1 over 1,024. Oh, gosh, so 2,048. What do we think about this sequence? Yeah, I don't think this sequence is convergent. Um, in particular, if we were to try to take the tack of question 56, we could try to show this recursively defined sequence is monotonic and bounded, right, um, using an induction argument or something. But we would probably come to naught with that, um, because it's pretty clear to see why this is not monotonic. Why? It, yeah, it goes up, and then it goes down, and then it goes up again, then it goes down again, then it goes up even more, and then it's probably going to go down even more. So yeah, this thing is zigzagging. So monotonic, the monotonic convergence theorem is out. Um, if we tried to show this was bounded, we would probably run into similar issues. So this is probably not a convergent sequence, even though if it were convergent, its limit would satisfy L equals cube root of 2. Okay. But this person has gotten out ahead of themselves in their proof. We don't know that it converges, and so all this algebra doesn't necessarily find what its limit is. 59 is kind of a revisitation of an old group assignment problem where we talked about decimal expansions. Um, one or two of you actually used this approach on one of the quiz six problems, which is kind of cool. Um, what the question is, how do I know that if I just write down an infinite decimal expansion using whatever digits I want to, so here we're kind of using the digits of radical two, but using whatever decimal digits I want to, how do we know that that sequence that we get, the sequence of rational numbers which is obtained by adding one more digit, how do I know that that's a convergent sequence? One way to get to that is to show that, in fact, it's a Cauchy sequence. So um, let's just look at uh, an example uh, here. Let's suppose that I want to show that for a given capital N, let's suppose we take N equals 2 or something like that. We want to show then for all N and M that are greater than or equal to 2, so in this example, that would be all of the terms in the sequence which come at least after the second one, right? that the difference between the xn's and the xm's is less than or equal to 1 over 10 to the n minus 1. So in this example, that would be 1 over 10 to the 1, or 0 0.1. So the question is sort of, how do I know that if I take any one of these two terms and subtract it from any one of these other two terms, that the difference is going to be less than or equal to 0 0.1? What's your argument for that? Say I take S5 minus S3. That's 1.4142 minus 1.41. And so when I subtract these, I get something which is indeed less than 0.1.
How do you explain why this necessarily will always happen? I don't exactly remember what I wrote, but I think it was something on the lines of because you're like adding like a decimal to everything, mm -hmm. it's like forever increasing. Okay. Um, so S2 will be greater than S1, and S3 will be greater than S2, which is greater than S1. So it'll be a pattern like that, and that's why, like, that, that I, I can't remember the conclusion, but I just remember, like, sure. Um, yeah, that was actually the question on the quiz that you might be thinking of. Um, but yeah, that's one way to, to look at it, is that we know that this sequence is always increasing. At least it's non-decreasing, because what if I add a zero in one of the decimal places, right? Then I'm going to get equal to instead of less than. But we know that the sequence is never going to turn around. It's always going to be monotonic, for one thing. Um, and so one of the approaches on the quiz problem that you might think of when we come back to the quiz on Monday um, is monotonicity, right? So this is a monotonic sequence, but that doesn't necessarily, it's not specific enough to give us this assertion, right? This assertion that the xn's minus the xn's are less than or equal to 1 over 10 to the n minus 1. So let me put it this way. You're focusing on what's different from one term to the next. What's the same from one term to the next? Yes, right. All of the first uh, n minus 1 decimal places are the same between those two terms. And that's all. That's all that uh, I really want to say about this one, xm and xn, right? Um, so because all those decimal places were the same, in the example we just did, those are the 1.41s, right? Then those are just going to wipe one another out, and the only differences are going to be less than that, right? They're going to be in, in places that are they're further along in the line. And knowing that that difference can be controlled by 1 over 10 to the n minus 1, then the rest of the proof shows how you can use that to show um, that this sequence satisfies the Cauchy criterion and therefore is convergent.